Welcome to the Republican Professor Podcast. I'm your host, Lucas J. Mather. I am happy to be here with you tonight on the evening of the 6th of March, 2024. We've just had an election, primary election in California, which is where I'm recording from in Orange County, California. And we are in the middle of a series with uh, Professor Helmut Thielicke from the University of Hamburg on theology and American politics. He taught theology. He's a longtime professor of theology there in Germany. He lived through the Nazis and he lived through the Cold War split of Germany between East and West and um, had, had opportunity to, to reflect deeply about communism and national socialism, both types of socialism on the left. I'm gonna do an excursus today uh, with this pamphlet right here, what is right and what is left. Uh, we're gonna make fair use of the teachings of a figure named Dr. W. Cleon Skousen and uh, we'll get a little bit into this. I don't think we're going to do a long one tonight, but I'm going to do a, a reading from Skousen. So he's our guest today. Let's welcome Dr. W. Cleon Skousen to the podcast. <laughs> he's going to join us through his teaching on his uh, what is right, what is left, what is right, a study of political extremism. It's a little pamphlet that I came across when I was a kid in high school. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I came across it, <laughs> um, but my copy was published in 1981 by the Freeman Institute. And um, so we'd like to thank the Freeman Institute, <laughs> uh, which I don't think exists anymore. I think it, it changed somehow. I'm not sure how I, I'm not sure the story of that, but I wanted to expose you. If you can find a copy of it, they're extremely difficult to find. I mean, maybe somebody's got a box of these somewhere, but I had a copy as a kid and I could have swore I had it when I was in the Navy. I remember talking about it with people in the Navy, people that had gone to college. I, when I went into the Navy, I was right out of high school. And uh, I was very interested in these ideas of how do you define right and left? Um, and uh, a lot of my classmates, when I was in uh, studying Chinese at the Defense Language Institute, had gone to college and um, had majored in political science or something like that. Well, I don't know where my copy is uh, from those days. I've since replaced this. I found this on eBay. And this is the only one I've ever seen on eBay. So I'll I'll take a look again to see if there's another copy somewhere. I'm sure people have boxes of somebody's got boxes of this. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to find it to to to. I mean, it's not like Tilika. Tilika. Um, thanks to Fortress Press is still with us um, through through his writing. But 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 so Cleon Skousen uh, died before we were able to get him on the podcast. My understanding is that he died a while ago. Um, but <clears throat> I'm going to do a performative reading. Uh, and and then and we'll we'll do a transformative use, uh, make a fair use of this material, and uh, we'll have some discussion about it if you'd like. Uh, please put your questions or or what have you in the comments. Here's Cleon Skousen, page one. What is left? What is right? Someone here in the uh, in red pen, this is not my handwriting, put communism, fascism. 
I think he would say not too fast. Not too fast. It is terribly unfortunate that the writers on political philosophy today have undertaken to measure various issues in terms of political parties instead of political power. No doubt the American founding fathers would have considered this a rather amazing development. For example, today it is popular in the classroom as well as the press to refer to communism on the left and fascism on the right. People and parties are often called leftist or rightist without the public really understanding what they are talking about. These terms actually refer to, and as a kid, man, I was like, yeah, I want to know. I want to know this. I wrote for my school newspaper and I was very opinionated about political stuff. And, you know, uh, so I was thinking about this really young. People and parties are often called leftist or rightist without the public really understanding what they're talking about. These terms actually refer to the manner in which the various parties are seated in the parliaments of Europe. Well, that's a boring answer. With the radical revolutionaries, usually the communists on the far left and the military dictatorships such as the fascists, my guess he have Franco in mind in Spain, He's, he's usually called a fascist. And then Mussolini, and you have, of course, Hitler, right? Military dictatorships as, such as fascists on the far right. Other parties are located in between. Measuring people and issues in terms of political parties has turned out to be philosophically fallacious, if not totally misleading. This is because the platforms or positions of political parties are often superficial and structured on shifting sand. Consequently, the platform of a political party of one generation can hardly be recognized by the next. Furthermore, communism and fascism turned out to be different names for approximately the same thing, the police state. We're just over halfway through his first page, and we're only going to go a few pages in for our discussion today. But I'm telling you, when I saw that, when I read that, when I was a kid, I was like, intuitively, that made a lot of sense to me. I couldn't articulate it before. I couldn't give you an argument for it at the time. Um, but as I read this, and I mean, I've done a lot of study of this. You know, I have a PhD now. It's not like I'm just some high school kid in the Navy. I, I was, you know, I, 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 I've taught 180 courses. Sorry, 190 courses. And I, I spent a long time in graduate school, my poor wife. And I'm going to read that again. W. Cleon Skousen, page one, what is left, what is right, a study in political extremism. Get a copy if you can. Okay. Furthermore, communism and fascism turned out to be different names for approximately the same thing, the police state. They are not opposite extremes, but for all practical purposes are virtually identical. Okay, I'm going to stop here and get a drink of water. It's raining out and I'm enjoying some green tea and some nice water. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's uh let's let's do a little bit more. Let's press into a little bit more. Let's hear uh, more of the teaching of W. Cleon Skousen. 
I don't know much about the man. I, I, I know he was a Mormon. Um, I think he was an FBI agent for a while. And I think he went to law school. I don't, I'm not sure where I found out this information. Let me, uh, let me uh, check something really quick. You know, I don't, I'm, I don't recommend doing this, going to Wikipedia to finish any kind of research. Sometimes it's okay to start there just to poke around and see what people are saying. Um, according to his Wikipedia, um, <laughs> this is kind of funny. Um, to me, it's funny. Uh, let's, let's take a look at the Wikipedia really quick. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. And if you're listening only and there's no video, I apologize. But um, the very first thing they mention on the Wikipedia is he's a notable anti-communist and supporter of the John Birch Society. Um, now, the, I don't want to get this uh, sidetracked into the John Birch Society, um, but... Uh, you can poke around in that if you want. We'll talk more about that later if you want. But the reason it's interesting that that is the way they describe him, whoever wrote that, was is because if you read what he's saying here, he's equally anti-fascist, but that's not mentioned at all. Uh and I think it's it's a it's a weird omission, given that uh, he's clearly against the police state in all of its uh, manifestations, including national socialism, including uh, nationalist dictatorships. What, however you define fascism, uh, which would include Nazism, and so he would be an anti-Nazi as well. So, it, you know, I just think it's it's interesting. You got to take this stuff with a, a grain of salt. He lived uh, till he was 92, apparently. He was in law enforcement. So I, I knew he was in the, I think he was uh, an FBI agent for a while. Um, it says he went to George Washington Law School. Um, I, I do remember believing that as a kid. And so I, that, that fits with what I knew before. Okay. And yes, he was Mormon. So just a little bit, I mean, he's not like a pure scholar, like, you know, many people who teach college and that might be a compliment to him because the colleges are a mess right now. They're just, uh, I, I I'm known for saying higher education is a, is a um, Democrat indoctrination, great inflation plantation at taxpayer expense. So that's what I think about college. Let's get back into what he says here in this pamphlet. Um, page one, uh, here's Skousen again. The American founding fathers used a more accurate yardstick. Government is defined in the dictionary as a system of ruling or controlling. And therefore, the American founders measured political systems in terms of the amount of coercive power or systematic control which a particular government exercises over its people. <laughs> sounds like the Nazis to me. It sounds like National Socialism. It sounds, it sounds right. In other words, the yardstick is not political parties, but political power. Using this type of yardstick, the American founders considered the two extremes to be anarchy on the one hand and tyranny on the other. At one extreme of anarchy, there is no government, no law, no systematic control, and no governmental power, while at the other extreme, there is too much control, too much political oppression, too much government or as the founders called it, tyranny. The object of the founders was to discover the balanced center between these two extremes. They recognized 
that under, I'm on page two now, the chaotic confusion of anarchy, there is no law. Whereas at the other extreme, the law is totally dominated by the ruling power and is therefore ruler's law. What they wanted to establish was a system of people's law, where the government is kept under the control of the people and political power is maintained at the balanced center with enough government to maintain security, justice, and good order, but not enough government to abuse the people. The founders' political spectrum might be graphically illustrated as follows. <laughs> And you'll see the red mark of the person who prior owned this prior, but mentioned Louis the 16th. Is that right? Yeah. Um, can you see that? I guess I got to hold it just right for you to see it. Now, I, I would just say that unless you're living on an island <laughs> by yourself, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand exactly what he means by anarchy. Um, because if there are more than one person, there's some kind of rule going on. And probably there's somebody who's more powerful. And so... I, I think uh, that's just the nature of human beings. You know, I just think that if, if there's any interaction between people, there's there's some kind of power dynamic. And uh, there are more powerful people in small groups. And, and uh, so I'm not sure, I, I guess you could just say that's not government. That's just people. But I think if the group is small enough, there's no distinction between those two things. So there could be tyranny, I think. I, I just think of anarchy as... It, it, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I, I, I do like the way he did the... The in the abstract, he did the the tyranny versus anarchy. The founders didn't really think of tyranny. I'm thinking of Madison and Federalist 47 as um, exactly too much government. The issue was whether the levers of different parts of government are in the same hands and and whether that's a f one few or many whether inherited or elected uh that's a problem having it in the same hands so as long as you keep that definition of tyranny in your mind i, I think that this has a lot going for it i'm on page two we'll do do a little bit more of this okay the founders struggle to discover the balance center. In the Federalist Papers, number nine, Hamilton refers to the sensations of horror and disgust which arise when a person studies the histories of those nations that are always in a state of perpetual vibrations between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. Okay, so he's now giving you an argument for why the founders had a, a a more principled understanding of, of what you could call left and right. Let's call anarchy right and let's call tyranny left. And uh, so what's going to happen is the communists like Stalin and the National Socialists are really on the same side. They're on the left side. When, <clears throat> if you if you zoom in, to where they would be on this, uh, that it might be that they're so close you can't really tell. But if you zoom in, there's a, there may be some distance between 
you know, a Hitler and a Stalin, let's say. But what Skousen is saying, I think, is what he's where he's headed is that um, when you zoom in, then maybe Hitler is on the right of that tiny little frame and then Stalin is on the left. Maybe, maybe actually the opposite. But uh, either way, it would be misleading to say that fascism is on the right and communism is on the left because they're both so far on the left. It's really just when you zoom in and you got a small frame, it appears that Hitler is on the right and, and Stalin is on the left. But when you zoom out, you realize they're actually way both way over on the left. And the American founding as designed and properly implemented closer to the founders uh, design by the Republican Party and ending slavery. Yeah. Uh, that would be kind of in the middle more, but at least as it's designed. Maybe, I'm not saying in practice there's not problems. There has been problems with the growth of the administrative state and uh, the growth of government in the uh, second half of the 1800s and, and on. So what uh, Skousen is doing here is he's, he's going back to the founders, going back to the Federalist Papers, and he's, he's quoting them and and he's trying to discern whether there's some support here for how he's thinking about it so he's got the ruler's law on the left the people's law in the middle no law on the right okay washington also refers to the human struggle wherein there is a natural and necessary progression from the extreme of anarchy to the extreme of tyranny Franklin noted that there is a natural inclination in mankind to kingly, kingly government. He said it gives people the illusion that somehow a king will establish equality among citizens and that they like, oh, sorry, uh, and that they like. <laughs> That's the quote. Franklin's great fear was that the states would succumb to this gravitational pull toward a strong central government symbolized by a royal establishment. He said, I am apprehensive, therefore, perhaps too apprehensive, that the government of the, these states may in the future times end in a monarchy. But this catastrophe, I think, may be long delayed if in our proposed system we do not sow the seeds of contention, faction, and tumult by making our posts of honor places of profit. The founder's task was to somehow solve the enigma of the human tendency to rush headlong from anarchy to tyranny. The very thing which later happened in the French Revolution how could the American people be constitutionally structured so that they would take a fixed position at the balanced center of the political spectrum and forever maintain a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, which would not perish from the earth? That's a nice little addition Republican rhetoric there from President Abraham Lincoln. You. I'm on page three now at the top. It took the founding fathers 180 years from 1607 to 1787 to come up with their American formula. <clears throat> In fact, just 11 years before the famous Constitutional Convention at Philadelphia, the founders wrote a constitution which almost caused them to lose the Revolutionary War. Their first attempt at a constitution writing was called the Articles of Confederation. <laughs> I'm going to make a comment about two or so sentences ago 
took the founding fathers 180 years. Um, 1607. I, I'm not sure I would call the people that arrived in 1607 founding fathers. Um, I would call them colonists. And certainly the colonists over those that century and a half were um, developing and passing down a, a body of, of experience in self-government that was virtually unparalleled at any point in human history. As uh, Charles Thatch mentions in his creation of the presidency book, which I highly recommend and I should get to it at some point. We're going to do that. We're going to do Thatch on the pre presidency. And Thatch talks a lot about the, the uh, disaster of the Articles of Confederation. Let's do another section here. Page three. The founders' first constitution ends up too close to anarchy. The American Revolutionary War did not commence as a war for independence, but was merely designed to protect the rights of people from the arrogant oppression of tyr a tyrannical king. Nevertheless, by the spring of 1776, it was becoming apparent that a complete separation was the only solution. It is interesting that even before the Declaration of Independence, the Continental Congress appointed a committee on June 11, 1776 to write a constitution. John Dickinson served as chairman of the committee and wrote a draft based on a proposed Proposal made by Benjamin Franklin in 1775. However, the states felt that Dickinson's so-called Articles of Confederation gave too much power to the central government. They therefore hacked away at the draft until November 15, 1777, when they proclaimed that the new central government would have no powers, whatever, except those expressly authorized by the states. And the states did not expressly authorize much of anything. Under the Articles of Confederation, as finally adopted, there was no executive, no judiciary, no taxing power, and no enforcement power. The national government ended up being little more than a general committee of the states. It made recommendations to the states and then prayed they would respond favorably. Very often they did not. What he's referring to is that, I mean, even basic things like paying for the war didn't happen. See, see Valley Forge. On the founders' political spectrum, the Articles of Confederation would appear as follows. As there's a nice little representation there at the bottom of the screen. And if you can't see that, well, we're going to say more and you can just keep listening here. I'm on page four. The suffering and death at Valley Forge and Morristown were an unforgettable demonstration of the abject weakness of the central government and its inability to provide food, clothes, equipment, and manpower for the war. At Valley Forge, the common fare for six weeks was flour, water, and salt mixed together and baked in a skillet, fire cakes, as they were called. Out of approximately 8,000 soldiers, around 3,000 abandoned General Washington and went home. Approximately 200 officers resigned their commissions. Over 2,000 soldiers died of starvation and disease. Washington attributed this near disaster at Valley Forge to the constitutional weakness of the central government under the Articles of Confederation. So this is setting the stage for the Constitution, writing the Constitution and adopting it. The genius of the Constitutional Convention in 1787, no one, not one of the founding fathers could have come up with the much needed constitutional formula by himself, and the delegates who attended the convention knew it. I agree with that. At that very moment, the states were bitterly divided. The, con the continental dollar was inflated almost out of existence. The economy was deeply depressed and rioting had broken out. New England had threatened to secede and both England and Spain were standing close by ready, close by ready to snatch up 
the disunited states at the first propitious opportunity. Writing a constitution under these circumstances was a frightening experience. None of the delegates had expected uh, the convention to require four tedious months. In fact, within a few weeks, many of the delegates, including James Madison, were living on borrowed funds. From the opening day of the convention, it was known that the brainstorming discussions would require frequent shifting of positions and changing of minds. For this reason, the convention debates were held in secret to avoid public embarrassment as the delegates made concessions, reversed earlier positions, and moved gradually towards some kind of agreement. And uh, by the way, um, that was in the summer. And uh, Philadelphia gets hot in the summer and they closed the windows and doors to keep the secrecy. So you can imagine a world without air conditioning, trying to discover how to create a, a national government that avoids the tendency to tyranny for the first time in human history and doing it without air conditioning. And by the way, did you see how they dressed? the the kind of outfits they wore you know they're not they're not wearing wife beaters you know to encourage the delegates to freely express themselves without the usual formalities of a convention the majority of discussions were conducted in what they called the committee of the whole I'm on page 4 this committee consisted of all the members of the convention but as a committee Decisions were always tentative and never binding in the same way they would have been if voted upon by the convention. Only after a thorough ventilating of the issues would the committee of the whole turn itself back into a sitting of the convention and formally approve what they had just discussed in the committee. If you read the notes on the Constitutional Convention that are published, like Madison has the most... Uh, thorough set and i mean he did a pretty good job but we really only have his uh thorough set to go by and um he, he talks about the committee of the whole and all that um the object i'm on page five now uh the object of the founders was to seek a consensus or general agreement on what the constitution should provide. After four months of debate, they were able to reach a, green, a general agreement on just about everything except the issues of slavery, proportionate representation, and the regulation of commerce. All three of these issues had to be settled by a compromise. It is a mistake, however, to describe the rest of the constitution as a conglomerate of compromises because extreme patience was used to bring the minds of the delegates into agreement rather than simply force the issue to finality with a compromise. This is demonstrated in the fact that over 60 ballots were taken before they resolved the issue of how to elect the president. They could have let the matter lie after the first ballot, but they did not. They were anxious to talk it out until the vast majority felt good about the arrangement. That is why it took 60 ballots to resolve the matter. I'm going to take a sip of green tea. When the founders had finished their work on September 17th, 1787, President Washington attached a letter to the signed draft and sent it to Congress. The Congress ratified the Constitution without any changes and sent it to the states. When several of the larger states threatened to reject the Constitution, they were uh, invited to ratify the main body of the Constitution, but offer suggested amendments. Uh, they submitted 189. And at the first session of Congress, these, when it was passed, when there was a new Congress, uh, these suggested amendments were reduced to 12 by James Madison and 10 of them were finally approved and ratified by the states. Thus was born America's famous Bill of Rights. Okay, that's all. Let's have a little bit of discussion here. A little bit more. 
what what he's saying here is that the police state and this this goes really well with Tilica what we're covering in, with Tilica right now the police state i think it's fair to say is it would include both fascism and communism maybe communism is a bit more extreme uh, a bit more but if you want to say that the communism is left wing then you got to put other police states over there as well including national socialism and just even the name national socialism makes sense for that that's what they called themselves that's how they understood themselves now what about the extreme fights that uh, occurred between nazis and communists and and uh, so-called anti-fascists who are communists and fascists um well again i would say that they're both extremely left and if you zoom in to that part of the spectrum and and you, you zoom in far enough it might appear that there's somebody on the, the right of that frame and there's somebody on the left and that they're there there's this distinction but that would be a distinction without a difference once you zoom out and you're like a normal person and you're way over here in America, and we, we're looking at both as very far left wing. That's where we're headed, and that's what, what I got for you today. Um, and I really like that Cleon Skousen raised this issue for lay people to think about, and that he um, you know, interacted with the founding generation and how they were thinking about things and how they seem to understand this stuff. Uh, I, I share his aversion to tyranny in any form, not just communism, but also national socialism, and also the administrative state. I would say that there is a drift in the United States toward the left wing, and it and it's quite dangerous. And it's it's dangerous in a way that a lot of people can't really understand, articulate, um, because there's a lot of moving parts. I, I don't think most people understand how huge government is. I'll, I'll ask people how many agencies in the federal government in the in the executive branch can issue rules that have the force of law. And I'm still here. I'm I'm asking, do you know the answer to that question? If you follow me on Substack, I have given you the way to find the answer. I, I don't just come out and tell you. I do require a little bit of, of elbow grease. But for example, if I was to interview Donald Trump on this, I would ask him, how many agencies are making rules that affect American lives? And, and what are you going to do to make sure those rules are accountable to elected officials? Because these bureaucrats making the rules are not elected. All right, you can, sub, you can subscribe to the Republican professor on Substack. If you have a comment about this, you can make a comment on the YouTube video. Um, if you are listening on uh, audio only, like Stitcher or Pod, whatever it is, um, send me an email at the Republican Professor at Substack.com. If you have uh, suggestions for topics or you have thoughts, I I try to get back to people if I can. Um, if you're comment is interesting <laughs> i i might try to um you know incorporate that so you could have some kind of say uh, and then uh we'll see you next time take care